Uh, thank you, Michelle and Dr. Vipond. Uh, Michelle, if you can bring up the slides. Um, I'd also like to thank the rest of the group involved here for this grassroots efforts to bring information to Albertans. Quite honored to have the opportunity to talk today about airborne transmission and COVID-19. Obviously, I recognize I have only a limited amount of time and I really only be able to scratch the surface of this important topic. But what I want to start to do is to help demystify exactly what we mean when we talk about airborne transmission, provide a few of the best practices that people can start to use to help mitigate the risk of this transmission occurring in different places, and identify a few resources for people who may be interested in finding more information. So when we talk about airborne transmission, we first have to talk about aerosols. And aerosols are just a term uh, that is used to describe small particles in the air that tend to stick around uh, rather than fall quickly to the ground. And because these aerosols tend to stick around in the air, we can actually inhale them into our airways. And depending on their size, they can end up landing in different parts of our lungs, in our throat, our mouth, or our nose. And the first thing we need to realize about airborne transmission is that all of us actually produce aerosols when we do any number of activities like talking, singing, coughing, sneezing, and exercising. These aerosols that we produce are themselves made out of respiratory fluid and saliva, and anything that's actually contained within those fluids. So if you happen to be infected with SARS-CoV-2 and you're shedding virus, the aerosol that you emit from your mouth or nose can contain live viruses. And because aerosols tend to stick around in the air, if you emit aerosol containing live virus into a space, others who are sharing that space with you may inhale that virus themselves and end up becoming infected. And one area of confusion with airborne transmission is that uh, there's an idea that it occurs only over long distances. But what we now understand is that inhalation of aerosol occurs both in close proximity to the person who's emitting it, and it can also occur over longer distances and circumstances where you have, uh, where your ventilation isn't good enough to actually prevent the buildup of aerosol over time. And a very useful mental model for thinking about how these aerosols behave is actually the behavior of cigarette smoke and how that can build up over time in enclosed spaces. Obviously that buildup of cigarette smoke increases your risk of exposure indoors, and something similar, something very similar happens with SARS-CoV-2 that is contained in bioaerosols. Next slide. Now with COVID-19, we have seen a change in our understanding of transmission over the past several months. And both the CDC and the World Health Organization have concluded that inhalation of aerosol is important, both in close proximity to an infected emitter and over longer distances when ventilation is poor. So many of us aerosol scientists actually uh, conject that airborne transmission is by far the most important way that COVID-19 spreads. But either way, uh, we know that airborne transmission occurs frequently and that we do need to begin to implement measures to prevent it if we want to try to control transmission. And two small notes before we move on to talking about mitigating transmission. The first is that the Delta variant that is driving this fourth wave is much more transmissible than earlier variants, as I believe Dr. Gasparovic will be talking about shortly. And that makes it all the more important to use all the tools that we have available right now to keep a lid on transmission. And secondly, as Joe noted, um, people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 but not displaying symptoms of COVID-19 can and do transmit the disease to others. And this needs to be considered when we're determining what are and what are not useful mitigation measures. Next slide. So when it comes to mitigating transmission of this virus, a very useful way to think about this is the Swiss cheese model. The key with this model is to recognize that no single layer of mitigation is perfect, but we can vastly reduce the risk of transmission occurring in different scenarios when we begin to layer up individual actions like physical distancing and masks, together with shared actions and responsibilities like good testing, tracing, and isolating, uh, improving ventilation, implementing air filtration, and widespread vaccinations. And some of these layers can themselves be improved to make them more effective for, by example, educating the public on how to wear a mask properly and upgrading to better quality masks, a little bit of which I'll talk about later. And while we're very fortunate to have widespread access to vaccines that do do a very remarkable job in reducing severe outcomes, we also need to recognize right now in our current situation that vaccines alone are not preventing this fourth wave of the Delta variant without the use of other public health measures. So I think it's quite a good sign, and I'm actually very encouraged to see that municipalities like Edmonton are stepping up to reinstate mask mandates uh, because we absolutely know that masks are an effective tool to help mitigate transmission, especially when they're used by more and more people. Next slide. 
So let's talk about some of the things that we can do to reduce the chances of airborne transmission occurring in different environments. The first and one of the best ways is probably the most obvious, which is to simply get fully vaccinated and to vaccinate as many people as possible. So vaccination worked extremely well in reducing the risks of severe outcomes and does help to reduce the odds of getting sick in the first place. But as with any layer of protection, we know there's still a possibility of people who are fully vaccinated becoming infected and in transmitting the disease to others. This is why it is still very beneficial to implement universal masking indoors when we have considerable community transmission and to educate people on how to use masks properly. With, maskings, we want to, with, with masking, we want to think about three different factors, which is the fit of the mask to the face, the filtration ability of the material that the mask is made out of, and the comfort of the mask itself. So at this point in the pandemic, there are actually several options for members of the public to invest and upgrade to respirators like N95s and KF95s, KN95s. And these carry the benefit of being rigorously designed and tested to satisfy all three of those fit, filtration, and comfort criteria. And therefore, they can help provide the wearer a very high degree of protection. I do want to reiterate that any mask is better than no mask, but we do now how, how, uh, we do now have options for those looking for a higher degree of protection. And beyond masking, the realization of the importance of airborne transmission allows us to look at ventilation as a protective layer as well. So with ventilation, the aim is to bring in fresh air to indoor spaces and to properly re uh, filter recycled air to help reduce the risks of the buildup of virus-laden aerosol over time. The American Society of uh, Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers has actually released guidelines to optimize existing, inf existing infrastructure to this effect. And ASHRAE, um, this, this organization, has also released a very strong position statement that uh, states that airborne transmission of this disease is significant and should be controlled. This statement was also recently acknowledged and reinforced by our own provisional, uh, Provincial Professional Engineering Association, APEGA, uh, a few weeks ago. And this makes it very clear that there is an important role for engineers to play here in addressing this problem. And at present, and in light of the increased transmissibility of the Delta variant, the current recommended target for ventilation is six effective air changes per hour in locations like classrooms. It should be noted that this actually exceeds in many cases the minimum standards that were laid out prior to the pandemic, as such standards were typically not derived with the mitigation of an airborne pathogen in mind. Next slide. We can also begin to start triaging our current infrastructure by using simple methods like carbon dioxide measurements, since CO2 measurements can give us an idea of how good the ventilation is in an occupied space. Now, CO2 measurements give you an idea of the quality of ventilation, but they do not capture the risk of transmission occurring over short distances. So it's very important to continue masking and to maintain social distancing where possible, regardless of what the level of CO2 is in a space. But that being said, when CO2 levels begin to exceed about 1,000 parts per million, that's an indication that the quality of the ventilation in a space is poor, and additional measures like in-room filtration should be implemented to help mitigate the buildup of aerosols. There are also some very simple fixes here that we can be doing, like opening doors and windows, but such, me such methods are actually weather dependent and cannot be relied upon um, as we're moving into the winter months. Another useful layer of protection is in the form of in-room filtration for spaces where ventilation is suboptimal. And indeed, this is a measure that is advocated for by ASHRAE. Though there are a number of factors involved in the selection of these technologies that make it a good idea to follow experts on, the to on these topics for up-to-date guidance. There are several HEPA air purifiers on the market, so we're fortunate to have comparisons from independent researchers that can be used to guide the selection of a HEPA purifier that is right for the situation. And along these lines, there are actually a number of experts that have also designed what are known as Corsi Rosenthal boxes, which are essentially, essentially homemade in-room filters. But because of the optimization of the components and the design that has gone into them, many of these can actually provide quite good performance, in some cases better than commercial pro products, and for much cheaper. And finally, upper room germicidal ultraviolet light is another proven technology that has been used to great effect in mitigating the transmission of airborne diseases like tuberculosis. And this may be a really great option for many situations with SARS-CoV-2 as well. The last tool that I won't really mention too much, but I'll just note briefly, is actually rapid testing, which of course can help to identify people infected with COVID-19 who may be unwillingly spreading the disease to others. Next slide. So now that I've briefly mentioned some of the best practices, I want to identify a few things to avoid. Uh, the first is what is known as hygiene and filtration theater, 
uh, where we essentially devote resources to things that really don't do much in preventing the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, and in some cases may actually have unintended side effects. This can include things like deep cleaning, um, using chemical foggers and unproven air cleaning technologies that use buzzwords, the things like ozone catalyzers and bipolar ionization. Uh, and these technologies have been flagged by indoor air quality experts as unproven and potentially harmful. So this idea of hygiene infiltration theater can also include the use of an improperly sized HEPA cleaner for a given space, such that it actually has a negligible impact on mitigating risks associated with the buildup of aerosol. Another thing to think about is that with deep cleaning, if we're going to be deep cleaning a building after an outbreak has already occurred, this really won't be addressing the root causes of the outbreak, and so it likely won't be preventing future outbreaks from happening at all. So in my opinion, we need to be more diligent with our use of resources when we're actually starting to fight this disease. Another thing that we know now is that there are certain things that aren't helpful. Uh, like the overly, overly liberal use of plexiglass, um, because the forest of plexiglasses that have sometimes been put in place in an attempt to reduce um, what we thought of was the most important thing of being droplets. Uh, you know, this actually impedes effective ventilation of these sorts of indoor environments and can hamper the effective removal of infectious aerosols. So for that reason, it is not a good idea to be using um, uh, plexiglass in, in a lot of different scenarios. And we should also, where possible, be avoiding indoor gatherings without masks and consider moving outdoors for breaks and lunch as well, weather allows. A good practice is to stagger breaks and to make sure to evaluate ventilation of break rooms because this can help to reduce the chances of transmission events occurring in these sorts of environments where we often let down our guard and maybe remove our masks to have a bit of a bite to eat or a drink. Next slide. And finally, I'd like to recognize, uh, I'd like to identify a number of useful resources for people who are interested in finding out more information. So I recognize that we've covered a lot of ground in the past few minutes and I've really only scratched the surface, but I would encourage those who have questions to look into some of the resources I've provided here. So these include a conference held a few weeks ago that actually brought together memory, many of the leading experts in aerosol science and indoor air quality for tips and methods to reduce airborne transmission in schools. And I believe this Friday, we'll have a few panelists talking about that as well. And also the US CDC's guidance on mitigating transmission in the wider community. And for those who are looking for a bit more of a scientific discussion, there's also a really great article that came out last week in Science that dives into more of the details on airborne transmission and it provides a really good summary. So with that, thank you for your time and attention. Um, and I'll turn things back to Michelle. Thank you very much, Connor. I actually had a couple of questions, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, sure. Yep. Okay. So if Michelle is a human here who is not an aerosol scientist, is going to take three things home today from that, what are they going to be? The things I would take home today are avoid unnecessary indoor gatherings right now. Um, if you do have to be indoors with others, continue masking at all times. Just because you're two meters away from somebody else does not mean you are safe from inhaling aerosol emitted by those people. And probably the last one is that we should really start to begin evaluating ventilation in the different sorts of spaces that we're spending a lot of our time indoors. And is this a point in time where I should be looking at moving away from cloth masks and surgical masks if I can afford to go to an N95? Yes, if you can, it's not a bad idea to go toward those better performing masks. They'll provide the wearer with more protection. And we've actually seen a number of Canadian suppliers stand up and begin supplying these to members of the public outside of healthcare worker environments. So we do have the supply of these masks available. If you're able to afford them, I would encourage you to move on toward that sort of better functioning mask. Thank you very much, Dr. or Connor Rizicki, PhD candidate for joining us. Um, I am exceptionally thankful that you took the time today to be with us. And I know that this is going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, and yeah, thank you so very much for joining us.